Wow. Um, <laughs> um, I am overwhelmed um, to be here. This is quite an unexpected turn in my life um, <laughs> to be on a, on a panel here with, with Pragna and Joanna and Sophie and in front of all of you. Um, I didn't plan this. Uh, I'm not an academic feminist. I'm not a professional feminist. I'm not a radical feminist. I'm not a socialist feminist. I am a feminist, and I'm an ordinary woman who knows what a woman is and who refused to shut up about it. And as just about everyone, it seems, now knows I lost my job because of this. I did not bully anyone, and I did not harass anyone. I just wanted to talk about the difference between the idea of gender identity and the reality of sex, and about what the push to um, conflate the two of them would mean for women's rights. I wanted to talk about that and write about it and tweet about it and I lost my job. I worked at a think tank on international public policy, and I want to read out uh, the values of the think tank where I worked, the Center for Global Development. We are willing to challenge powerful institutions <laughs> and the status quo to promote better evidence-based practice. We are committed to transparency, diversity, and professional and personal integrity. We value mutual respect, a collegial workplace, and a healthy sense of humor. <laughs> Those are my values, and I stand by them. And I really love that job. Um, it took me a year of reading to build up the courage to tweet about the topic. A year of following and listening to women who've spoken up before me, um, many of whom are here in this room. Um, a year of reading mum's net threads and Twitter discussions and official documents which just did not make sense and did not give me any confidence that the people who were supposed to be the grown-ups were taking this seriously and had thought this through. So after a year of reading and educating myself, I decided to tweet about it. And it wasn't so much that I built up the courage, but the balance between fear and caution on one side and rage on the other just tipped to the point where I couldn't not speak about it. So during the run up to the, consultate, the end of the consultation on the Gender Recognition Act, I began to tweet about the issue. And a couple of months after I'd started, I got an email from HR, which said, the Center for Global Development does not require staff or affiliated experts to vet their public views and social media usage with the organization. However, do ask that these debates be free of exclusionary statements. There were several tweets you posted that are therefore problematic. For instance, you stated that a man's internal feeling that he is a woman has no basis in material reality. <laughs> A lot of people would find that offensive and exclusionary. <laughs> Definitions are exclusionary. I didn't think that sounded too bad, though. I understood the organiza organization's values, um, and I thought we would sort of be able to talk about it. Uh, they asked me to put a disclaimer on my Twitter bio to say that all tweets and views are my own, so I did that. Um, but over the next few months, First, a full-time job offer, then the offer to remain as a visiting fellow, and finally, the offer to stay on as a consultant were all gradually withdrawn from me. At one point in the process, I had a meeting with one of the senior managers who gave me the friendly advice that it is career-limiting to talk about this topic in public. 
and she asked me if this was really the hill that I wanted to die on. It turned out it was. So here I am. <laughs> After I lost my job, I tweeted about that, and the feminist lawyers arrived. Feminist lawyers, hands up feminist lawyers, there's a few of them. And we went to the employment tribunal with a case of belief discrimination and indirect sex discrimination. It was just the preliminary hearing, uh, the question of whether this belief is protected. Because in the UK, under the Equality Act 2010, religious and philosophical beliefs are protected against discrimination. We have a fundamental right to freedom of belief and freedom of speech. And that right's not worth much if you can lose your job for exercising it. The kinds of things that have qualified as philosophical beliefs under the Equality Act include Scottish nationalism, veganism and belief in, spiritual, in spiritualism. And this does not mean that people have to agree with each other's beliefs. It does not mean they have to pretend to believe them. It does not mean they even have to say that they respect them. It just means that at work or as providers of services, you must not treat people detrimentally because they hold a particular belief or do not hold a particular belief. So these were the beliefs that I took to the tribunal to be tested to see whether they were protected under the Equality Act. There are four. Number one, sex is a material reality which should not be confused with gender or gender identity. Number two, being female or male is an immutable biological fact, not a feeling or an identity. Number three, sex matters. And number four, in particular, it is important to be able to talk about sex in order to take action against the discrimination, violence, and oppression that still affect women and girls because they were born female. And number four relates directly to the demands that the women's liberation movement set out in the 1970s. Things like equal pay, contraception and abortion, childcare, an end to male violence against women, an end to discrimination against lesbians. All of these things relate to the way that society treats the people with the kinds of bodies that can ovulate, gestate and lactate and the way it treats the people with the kinds of bodies that can impregnate. And to talk about these things, it is really helpful to have words. <laughs> and our mother's generation, my mother's generation, found the words to talk about this, to talk about the unfairness between the way that men and women are treated in society. But our daughters are being told that it is unkind and exclusionary to even state the material reality that women are female, that being a woman is not a feeling, that being a woman is not a costume, and that being a woman is not something you can identify out of or identify into. We are being denied the language to talk about the condition of being female, and that means we are being denied the language to talk about women's rights. So, the judge, James Taylor, said that my belief that sex is immutable is absolutist and not worthy of respect in a democratic society. So that means I should have no protection against discrimination for expressing this belief in any circumstance. 
And this is a belief that was totally ordinary 50 years ago. It was not even a question when the Women's Lib Conference was going on. It was a belief that was totally ordinary five years ago. And it is a belief that is totally ordinary today. The vast majority... The vast majority of people believe and understand this if they are willing to be truthful. Because it's a belief that is known as stating the bleeding obvious. <laughs> Humans can't change sex. And that belief is not incompatible with treating people with respect, including men and women who don't conform to gender norms in their appearance, or who undergo body modifications, or who want to express themselves through gender identity. I do not believe that everyone has an innate gender identity. But, <laughs> but we can treat other people with consideration and without discrimination, without being compelled to pretend that we share their beliefs. <laughs> so, Two weeks ago, we filed notice of appeal to the Employment Tribunal. There are lots of legal points in the appeal, but fundamentally, it is about whether it is acceptable to talk about women's rights, including the right to privacy and dignity, and including the right to freedom of association in single sex spaces. <laughs> and using ordinary language that everyone can understand. So this is what the judge said. He said, it is quite possible to accept that trans women are women <laughs> but still argue that there are certain circumstances in which it would be justified to exclude certain trans women from spaces that are generally only open to women assigned female at birth <laughs> because of trauma suffered by users of the space who have been subject to sexual assault. I say it is unfair, inhumane, and unworkable to require us to negotiate our rights using this tortured language. <laughs> to, be, to be forced to talk about women assigned male at birth and women assigned female at birth when what we mean is males and females. And it is unfair, inhumane, unworkable, and misogyny writ large to only offer women privacy and consent over who gets to see and touch their bodies if they disclose that they have already been subject to sexual assault. Why can we not use ordinary language and trust what we see? Why can we not be allowed to ask a service provider if a changing room or a hospital ward is women only and expect a straight answer? Why, why can't men who want to use women's single sex spaces or compete in women's sports to validate their gender identity accept that that is just not appropriate? I've stood up to this because I can. My children are not tiny. I have an education. I'm articulate. 
I'm not easily cowed. I have a family that is standing behind me. Uh, most of my friends are standing with me and many new ones. I seem to have the right mix of anger and politeness, <laughs> optimism, perseverance, and sheer bloody-mindedness to take this forward. I have a brilliant legal team. I have the support of the 3,000 odd people who supported the crowdfunder. I've got Mum's Net. Where's Mum's Net? Where's Mum's Net? Put your hands up. I've got a local group which started off with four people in the pub and is now about 40. Um, Hearts Women. If you haven't got a local group, find one or start one. It's brilliant. I have the support of JK Rowling. I went to Scotland last week. I learned to say her name correctly. <laughs> I have the support of the 200,000 people who liked her tweet, or more. <laughs> I say, or more, because Twitter keeps um, disappearing the likes, so who knows how many millions really liked that tweet, I'm going to say. But I also stood up because I can, because others can't. If I can't talk about sex in ordinary language, then what about children in school? People with learning difficulties. <laughs> women in prison. Women in refuges. Women who speak English as a second language. Elderly women in hospital. We all need words. I will stand beside Labour women, Conservative women, Liberal Democrats, Greens, SNP, and the women who find themselves politically homeless. Democrats and Republicans, men of all political stripes, transsexuals who do not demand that we deny reality. People who are motivated by religion and people who have no religion. Because a free society depends on protecting the beliefs we do not share and debating ideas openly. And one reason why it's become so hard to, and so dangerous to state the bleeding obvious is that organizations and people with influence, like my employer, have rolled over and abandoned their values of evidence, open debate, and integrity when faced with offence taking. They've retreated into silence and mind-numbing, simplistic slogans. So I'm thinking about who is not here. Amnesty International, <laughs> the Fawcett Society, <laughs> the Equality and Human Rights Commission, Liberty, Free. the trade unions, Free. professional associations, Free. much of the media, Free. and so-called thought leaders and many politicians, and even Starbucks, which came out in support of <laughs> paediatric transitioning yesterday. There are too many to count, and my disappointment with them is bottomless. They could have made the space for evidence-based public debate, but they didn't. Perhaps like many of us, they initially mistook this for a sideshow, a toxic internet debate, a conservative right-wing movement on the wrong side of history. Perhaps they weren't paying attention. Perhaps they were scared and they wanted a quiet life. Perhaps they failed to notice the bullying and abuse because it happens to women. 
I think by now they should have noticed. And they should have noticed that this is about the basic ability to speak the truth and to do your job. It is about the integrity of organizations. Because if you can make people lie about something, you can make them lie about anything. But I've given up wondering where the grown-ups are. We are the grown-ups. And I see so many people here who have stood up in so many different ways that you'll meet all your heroes today. Um, so I think something really important is happening in the UK. We're small enough and organized enough and angry enough to be pushing back on this in a way that women in North America and in other places have not been able to do effectively yet. And there are really positive signs of change. It is hugely significant that we are here being hosted today at UCL and being welcomed. <laughs> and not just tolerated. Thank you. And the information about the venue was published weeks ago, not hours ago. This is new. This year, Women's Place UK held a meeting at Oxford University, and Cambridge Rad, Rad Femmes held a meeting at Cambridge University. Mainstream women's organisations like the Women's Resource Centre and the Women's Budget Group are not shying away from this debate, and they're here. <laughs> and SBS, Philia, and the Centre for Women's Justice. <laughs> Index on Censorship has stood up for me. And the unexpected level of feedback on the government's consultation, I think, has made them sit up and realize that self-ID is not the simple good thing that they thought it was. We can speak up and we can be heard. And inside every workplace, every school, every college, every university, every political organization and association, there are women and men trying to find the courage to speak up and a strategy for doing it without losing their job. There is safety in numbers and they can't fire us all. <laughs> so one thing I want to ask you to do today to help to cope with your rage, um, whether you have spoken up publicly or not, one thing you can do here now before you leave today is um, this is the consultation of the Scottish Government on self-ID, which is live at the moment. Um, we have enough forms for everyone. They will be in the cafe where the stalls are. The first stall on the right um, is the Fair Play for Women stall and we've set up there. Uh, fill in the form, put it in the post box, it will get to Edinburgh. Um, because what happens in Scotland will affect what happens in the UK. And what happens in the UK will affect the rest of the world. These people, us in this room, standing up for women's rights and democracy, we will make a difference. <laughs>